So my name is Julio Pellicer. I come from the University of Valencia. The title of my talk is Structure Determination. I would like to have spoken about X-ray diffraction and absorption, but I have no time. So I'm going to, to speak only about X-ray diffraction. But anyway, I would like to draw your attention to this powerful technique, X-ray absorption, which is very cherished to me. And I will give you some references at the end of the talk. So, I'm going to speak mainly about X-ray diffraction, about the technique. And at the end, if, depending on time, I'm going to give you some, ex some examples. What, first of all, I will deal with the particularities of X-ray diffraction at high pressure. And we are going to see why synchrotron radiation is so important. I will dedicate some time to synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation also allows you different approaches to X-ray diffraction including not only angle dispersive X-ray diffraction, but also energy dispersive X-ray diffraction. <clears throat> I will also uh, speak a little bit about uh, single crystal X-ray diffraction. So, which are the limitations of a so well-known technique as, as X-ray diffraction at high pressure? The first one is the sample size. Pressure is force divided by surface. So if you want to arrive to achieve higher pressure, you have to, to work with small samples. And small samples mean small beams. Also, you have a sample environment. And it's well known that if you want to reduce absorption, you have to work with higher energy. So we, we need hard X-rays. An additional advantage of X-rays is that you have more reflections. In the example I, I have worked here, I have simulated, we have here an X-ray diffraction spectra of a transparent conductive oxide, uh, a simulation which is done with a SOTA wavelength that is usually available at the labora laboratory, that is the molybdenum KH. We see that with uh, with a usual large amount mill cell, we have only 10 reflections with this wavelength. But if we use synchrotron radiation and we use uh, for 0 0.4 wavelength, we have 46 reflections. We have uh, more information. It's clear with 46 reflections than with, with only 10. So the main conclusion is that we need an intense, highly collimated, and hard X-ray beam. And that's synchrotron radiation. So, what is synchrotron radiation? A synchrotron radiation is, is an, an, a synchrotron is an accelerator. But in our field, synchrotron radiation is usually the term. Synchrotron radiation is usually used to 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 label the radiation emitted by charged charged particles, usually electrons, when they are deviated by magnetic fields. Synchrotron is also used to refer to the building that is more complicated because we have an electron gun here which uh, yields electrons which are accelerated in a linear accelerator here up to some 100 me mega electron volts. Then we have the synchrotron itself with, which is this accelerator which increases the energy of the electrons up to some giga electron volts and then inject them to an storage ring here. In the storage ring, the electrons are keep circulating, and while they circulate, they arrive to bending magnets like this, where they are deviated, and when they are deviated, they emit synchrotron radiation. It is also possible in third generation synchrotrons to have insertion devices in the straight sections of the of the storage ring. And these insertion devices, I'm going not to speak fully about them, but they have special arrangements of magnets. So they force the electrons to perform particular trajectories in order to have uh, X-ray radiation with uh, special characteristics. Well, 
the radiation is emitted tangentially to the to the uh, storage ring, and and there there are laboratories which are designed to take profit of this radiation, and which are not only dedicated to X-ray diffraction, but to all fields in science, in chemistry, biology, physics, etc. So synchrotron radiation has a lot of advantages. It, it has a high brilliance, which means that it's very intense, but also that, that it is highly collimated, and it can be focalized to a very small spot. In addition, it covers a wide wavelength range from the infrared to hard X-rays. You have the possibility of linear and circular polarization. And finally, if you, you need to, you can also have time-resolved experiments. The characteristic of synchrotron radiation is summarized in this graph. <coughs> the radiation from magnetic magnets is continuous, like this. The radiation from the insertion device called, uh, called Wigglers is order of magnitudes more intense and also continuous is what is important for what I'm going to speak afterwards. And then we have undulators which, which uh, have harmonics, very high harmonics. Even more order of magnitudes of brilliance but at very well defined wavelengths. The general structure of a synchrotron radiation beam line is as follows. We have an insertion device, then a front end that is a window which isolates the, the vacuum of the storage ring from that of the beam line. <coughs> we have an attenuator which takes off some of the power emitted by the insertion device in order to the monochromator, which is downstream to, to work properly to, to avoid overheating the monochromator. The monochromator is usually constituted by a pair of silicon single crystals. Then we have a, a mirror working in grazing incidence, which removes the, the harmonics. And then a pair of focusing mi mirrors in a configuration which is called Kirkpatrick Vive, which focus the, the beam to the sample which diffracts, and this diffraction is collected typically by an image play. So, X-ray diffraction is the consequence of the, of the interference uh, of X-ray beams scattered by different crystalline planes. This interference condition is expressed in the black law relating for a given interplanar distance, the black law relates the wavelength and the angle. This, this equation is usually uh, exploited in laboratory equipment, fixing the wavelength and analyzing the intensity as the angle is changed. But in a synchrotron, we have also the possibility of fixing the angle and study what is happening when the energy of the wavelength is varied. So we have two kinds of experiments that can be performed, energy dispersive, X-ray diffraction experiments, and also angle dispersive, X-ray diffraction experiments. I'm going to speak first about energy dispersive fixed ray diffraction. In this kind of experiment, we have a white beam coming from a wiggler, which has a continuous spectrum. Then we have incident slits, the sample, which diffracts. We have exit slits and a detector, which is coupled with a multi-canal analyzer, which gives you uh, instantaneously or nearly instantaneously, the intensity versus energy. The main advantages of these techniques is that the acquisition of a spectrum is nearly instantaneous, so we can follow the kinetics of a chemical reaction, for example, in some milliseconds, two second res time resolution. We... <coughs> we... Uh, but we have... Another advantage, which is the main one of this kind of experiment, is that only the diffraction coming from, from this parallelogram is detected. The 
the, both the incident and exit slits determine the size, geometrically determine the size of this parallelogram, who, who is the only part of the sample which is seen by the detector. So we can, we, we remove the contribution from the sample environment and we are able to analyze only the sample. This is very important, for example, for light elements. <coughs> However, this technique has also disadvantages, and the main one are that there are parasite peaks, for example, fluorescence peaks, because we are studying what is happening in a wide range, wide energetic range, so we, we observe the, the fluorescence excited by, by the white beam. Uh, another disadvantage is that the resolution is very low, is of the order of 1%, that this is given by the multicanal analyzer, that's a problem. And the main disadvantage is that it's not easy to correct absorption, the absorption of the sample environment. And this is because the absorption depends on the energy. This is, we have a very complex environment with an absorption that depends on energy, and this is very difficult to correct. So we have not reliable intensities, and we, ha we cannot perform a quantitative analysis of the intensities, and most of the time we just look for the position of the peaks, so most of the time we obtain only the cell parameters for, from this kind of experiment. <coughs> this is an example of setup in the old ID30 at the ESRF. <coughs> we have the exit, the entrance slits here, the high pressure cell, which is motorized, then the exit slits and the detector, which is inside this uh, global, the germanium detector. It's a very simple setup. This is an example of energy dispersive X-ray diffraction spectra corresponding to, to this alloy. We see at the high pressure that the sample has the roxal structure, and in this direction, pressure is decreased, and at this end, we have a thin blend structure. In the intermediate region, we have an additional phase, which is called cinnabar. What we first appreciate is the rowless, uh, low resolution. Peaks are quite wide. We also observe that some peaks are overlap with uh, fluorescence, like this one. We have also some parasite peaks, escape, called escape peaks, here. A very small peak here. It's like a replica of the main peaks, but sifted by the absorption, by, by the KH energy absorption of germanium. Anyway, this, this spectra are, are useful and were, were used to identify the intermediate phase, which were not known before. So let me shift now to angle dispersive X-ray diffraction, which is the, the technique of choice nowadays with synchrotrons. We have a white beam coming either from a wiggler or here it's more convenient, an undulator most, most of the times. We have a monochromator, then the beam is collimated, arrives to the sample which diffracts, and we have a 2D detector, either an image plate or CCD. And I would like to underline that the image plate has to be read, digitized, and integrated uh, prior to obtain uh, an intensity versus angle spectra. So there is a, a software <coughs> procedure that must be done that takes time. And this is one of the disadvantages of the technique. <coughs> uh, the main advantage is that you can deal with intensities, you can perform polar experiments, and then make read well refinements. This is a scheme of, of a setup, well, a real setup with a direct X-ray, the collimator, the diamond and mill cell, which diffracts, and this diffraction is collected with an image plate. As an example of spectrum, we have a spectrum of uh, a Berlinite, 
a hyper spectrum, we, you can appreciate the differences in, in width of the peaks. Now that they are thinner. That's in part because of the resolution of the detector. That it is instead of one percent, it's zero one percent. We have a tenfold increase in, in resolution. The peaks are, are also thin because the sample has been uh, laser annealed. The important point here is that we can perform read bell refinements even at very, very high pressure of the order of, the, of megabars. <coughs> so, single crystal X-ray diffraction. First of all, single crystal is not as easy as pow pow uh, powder diffraction. We have to fulfill a vectorial condition, the Lagway condition, and that's, that's not so easy. You have to orientate the sample, and then you have to, to look for, for the diffraction at a given direction. So usually you need four circles, goniometers, and point detectors. The single crystal X-ray diffraction X-ray diffraction technique is a very well established technique which is complicated under high pressure. First of all, because there is absorption from the sample environment, this is not a real problem and there is a lot of software which is devoted to this task. So this, this is not a very big concern. You have a limited access to the reciprocal space compared to ambient pressure conditions. This could be a limitation, not a big one. You have reflections from the sample environment. These are usually they are easy to, to remove, that's no problem. Uh, a more important uh, drawback is that experiments are very long. In the example I'm going to, to talk to you about, uh, we measure four point four pressure points in a whole week. So w when when you are performing um, experiments in a synchrotron, this is a serious limitation. Then you don't have a global limit of what is happening with the sample. I mean that if you have some new phenomena that is happening at a direction where you are not looking at, you, you can completely miss what is happening. But the main problem of this technique is that very often we have reconstructive phase transitions. And if you begin with a single crystal and a reconstructive phase transition occurs, you are going to have usually not a single crystal, but a polycrystal, uh, which is with, and you don't know the orientation of any of these of the crystals forming the polycrystals, and it is very difficult even to index the new phase. So you are stuck, but because you are not at the conditions of single crystal or powder, and you have to, usually you have to perform new experiments to, to have an idea of the new structure. Anyway, it has lots of advantages. And the, the first one is that there is no reflection overlapping because uh, the reflections are in well-defined directions. Not, they, are, they don't constitute rings and a simple diffraction, which easily overlap. Also, there are no grain contacts, so the measurements can be made trially static. So this is, these are the ideal conditions to, to carry out experiments about the question of state. And I have brought here an example of a layer compound, gallium sulfide. And this is an image plate which was taken with a continuous acquisition. I mean that in order to fulfill the Lagway condition, what is usually done is to, to illuminate the sample with X-ray and then uh, turn the image plate, in or, uh, sorry, turn the <laughs> turn the diamond and mill cell in order to, to try to fulfill the, the, the lagwe condition. In this way, you can measure a series of X-ray diffractions. For example, here we have the 00L series, 002, 004, 006, etc. And 
in, in this image play, what I've done is using, I have used Photoshop to, to blend the spectra corresponding to two different pressure. The, the, the spectrum in blue, 0 GPA, and in red, 21 GPA. So we, we appreciate here the X-ray diffraction spots of diamond. We can just ignore them. The, the reflection spots from the pressure transmission medium, neon, in yellow, we can ignore them. And <coughs> we can also see that as pressure is applied, the, the spots continue to be spots. And that's important because that means that at high pressure, the sample is still a single crystal. We have some disorder here at high pressure. This some layer uh, orientation disorder, some mosaicity of the layers. And it's also clearly seen how, how distances decrease because it's easily seen that the red spots go to the outer part of the image plate and that means that angles are decreasing so the uh, distances sorry angles are increasing so distances are decreasing <coughs> there are more advantages in single crystal x-ray diffraction we we can measure thousands in this example you have nearly 2,000 reflections. They are not all independent. We have only some hundreds of independent reflections, 600 in this case. But with this big number of reflections, you, you can analyze systematic absences. And this gives you a lot of information about the special group. They doesn't uh, determine uh, uniquely the the spatial group at nearly. It's a very interesting information. We have access to reciprocal vectors, vectors opposite to distances. We have, there is much more information in vectors than in distances, like in polar uh, experiments. As we have also, as we have the intensity determined not by only one in reflection, but by a whole set of reflections symmetrically related. The information about intensity is very precise, so we can we can make uh, very detailed structural models. And as an example of these models, I have uh, I put here the example of uh, kappa wolframate. Kappa wolframate has a very low symmetric structure in ambient conditions where the kappa environment is modified by the jan teller effect. It's octaedra, it has an octahedral environment with the main axis in this direction, with the longest axis in this direction. When precise applies, you, you have a phase transition, and with single crystal X-ray diffraction, we, we could uh, analyze the, the the space group of the phase, uh, which is simply, corresponds simply to a change of the Jan Teller distortion. Well, not simply, but it's, it's, a, it's a detail. I mean, it's, it is only the, the distances about copper that are changing, and we are able to, to determine this under high pressure. This, I think this shows the, the, the possibilities of the technique. <coughs> now, it's very nice to work with single crystal X-ray diffraction to, in order to, to study light elements. And that's why that is opposite, once again, to powder diffraction. In powder diffraction, you have that all the, all the intensity corresponding to, to an interplanar distance is scattered in a, by symmetry in a very big solid angle. Whereas with a single crystal, of the, all the intensity corresponding to a reflection goes to a given direction. So finally, the, the intensity is, is bigger. So th it is very convenient to, st to study light elements which uh, diffracts in very small quantities. And it is particularly convenient when it is joined with energy dispersive fixed-ray diffraction. Because in this way, you can remove the contribution 
from the <coughs> from the diamonds, the, from the quantum scattering of the diamonds, and improve the signal to noise ratio. And in this example, the question of state of hydrogen could be measured. We have here how a single crystal of deuterium was formed at 14 GPA and how it, it was still a single crystal at some megabar pressure and authors were, were able to identify at different angles three diffraction peaks from which the two parameters of the hexagonal compact phase were extracted. So the, the equation of state of hydrogen could be uh, is, obtained thanks to the combination of single crystal X-ray diffraction and energy dispersive con configuration. So I have, I switch now to, to examples. First of all, about the question of state. I have already spoken about hydrogen. I would like to, to add only a few bits of information. Uh, hydrogen is, uh, at this pressure, is a molecular solid. In, uh, with hydrogen molecules at the lattice sites, hydrogen, the, the COA ratio of hydrogen is almost nearly equal to the ideal value, and this is interpreted as the hydrogen molecules being free to rotate in the lattice positions. But however, in this experiment it was shown that the COA ratio decreases under high pressure, so this is a sign of that molecules Molecules, molecules are orientating under high pressure uh, in the stacking direction. <coughs> Another example, coming back to, to this compound, gallium sulfide compound. This is a layer compound where the layers are formed by sulfur, gallium, gallium sulfur atoms. Inside the layers, the, the bond is covalent, and between the layers, the, the bond is weaker, much more weaker, and is called to be of the Van der Waals type. So we have two very, di very different interactions, and the interplay between these different interactions determines all the properties of the solid. And what is interesting is this, that high pressure can, can tune the 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 importance of these two interactions. It's also interesting about this experiment that we have a, a phase transition, a polytype phase transition, simply a change of in the stacking sequence of the layers. And, and it is interesting because it has a very small volume, and that's the point I, I would like to do here. You can, with single crystal X-ray diffraction, you can determine very precisely the volume. You can determine very small changes in volume. And uh, I, I, I read for you these, these numbers. In this phase transition, we have a change of volume of some 0 0.5 cubic Armstrongs in 24, in, in 40 Armstrongs, sorry, so it's less than is of the order of 0.1% volume change, and it could be determined. So it's a very precise technique. We have, from the evolution of the lattice parameters, we have direct information of the interactions in the solid. We can see that the A lattice parameter, which is along the layers, has a small compressibility, whereas the C parameter initially has a very strong compressibility related to the weak interlayer uh, interaction, but at high pressure, both the interlayer and interlayer interaction become similar, and then the slope of these parameters become very similar. I'm going to speak a little bit now about phase transition and the, and the hysteresis phenomena. <coughs> From a thermodynamic point of view, the, if you have two phases, alpha and beta, the one which is stable in ambient conditions is the one with the lowest Gibbs free energy. 
and as soon as pressure is applied, the, the free energy increases, and at a given pressure, which is the thermodynamic pressure, the beta phase has lower free energy than the alpha phase, and you should observe a phase transition. <coughs> this is not what usually happens. What usually happens in, in, the, in real experiments is that you observe the high phase transition at sorry, the phase transition at a higher pressure here, and in the downstroke you, you observe the reverse transition at a lower pressure here. This usually happens with first order transitions where you have a, a large, uh, large volume change which imply uh, bonding breaking, also atom migration and um, new bonding formation. This, is, this can be described with potential barriers. The sample has to overcome potential barriers in order to achieve the high pressure configuration. As an example, I have seen oxide here, which at low pressure has a wood side structure and at high pressure has a rock salt structure. We can see that in the upstroke, the, the phase transition is observed near thin GPA, whereas in the downstroke it is observed at only 2 GPA. As pressure is, uh, sorry, as temperatures increase, you have more energy to kinetically overcome this potential barrier, and the hysteresis seen is lower. From this graph, it could be guessed that the real thermodynamic uh, pressure phase the pressure for the phase transition is around 6 GPA. The hysteresis phenomena can, can use to, to obtain metastable phases in ambient conditions. For example, in continuing with synoxide, we see that this 2 GPA pressure value for the downstroke is already very low and it can be translated to ambient pressure. Uh, for example, preparing the sample in as, no, as a nanopoda. If you prepare the sample as a nanopoda, you can have a metastable rock salt phase. Or you can alloy the sample with some, with some compound, in this case cobalt, in order to have a rock salt synoxide compound. Well, continuing with hysteresis, how to overcome these potential barriers? I'm going to speak once again about berlinite. This is uh, a quartz type which draw attention because it was supposed to be, in this compound, a crystal to amorphous phase transition. With the particularity of the amorphous phase being elastically <coughs> anisotropic. And also, it seemed, it was thought that this compound has a structural memory in the sense that that in the reverse transition, you, you could recover the single crystal with the same or orientation as uh, before performing the, the, the pressure experiment. In fact, what happened was that you have a very, very sluggish phase transition. As angle diffraction, X-ray diffraction experiments with synchrotron show, you, if you begin with a single crystal, you start to have diffraction peaks from the new phase at some 15 GPA. And the problem is that with this very sluggish transition, the quality of the high pressure phase is very low. The peaks of the high pressure phase are very wide and they are very difficult to, to index. So the message here is that in this case, you, you can thermal anneal your, your sample in order to overcome the potential barriers. It's not usually enough to external heat in the, the, the diamond cell. What you usually need is to laser heat in your sample. If you use laser heating, instead of having this kind of spectra, you have very well defined peaks from which you can obtain a reliable indexing. You can use also hysteresis to, to follow a particular 
path in the pressure temperature phase diagram in order to look for new phases. I come back also to this example with, thing, with this alloy where you can see that in the upstroke you go directly from the zinc blend to the rock salt phase. However, in the downstroke you observe this cinnabar intermediate phase. And that's because the cinnabar phase has internal degrees of freedom and if you choose in, in a proper way this internal degrees of freedom, the cinnabar phase is very, very similar to the, or is equal to the rock salt phase. So the, the potential barriers from the, to overcome from the rock salt to cinnabar phase are very, very small. However, they are very big if you go from the zinc blend to the cinnabar phase. So the cinnabar phase is only seen in the downstroke. Here, for example, we study the phase diagram pressed as, as a function of selenium content, both in the upstroke here and in the downstroke here. You can see that the cinnabar phase is only appreciated in the upstroke when the selenium content is small, but this phase is observed in the whole concentration range when, the cel uh, when, when we study what's happening in the downstroke. And now I will finish with an example of synthesis. And the main synthesis example is the synthesis of diamond, which was first performed by Tracy Hall at the end of 54, where, while he was working at General Electric. The conditions for diamond syst uh, synthesis depend on which catalyzer are you using. Uh, if, you, if you want to, to analyze what's, how, how could you perform your synthesis in, in your laboratory, you are working with a black box. I mean, you can choose a, a catalyzer, you can guess your pressure temp temperature conditions, perform the experiment, and just hope that everything is going to, to happen as you expect. It's much more convenient to, to perform an in situ experiment. That's the idea of, of this slide, to perform an, an in situ experiment. So you can, you can establish directly what's, which are the pressure temperature conditions of the experiment. As an example, I, I have looked in the bibliography this, this work by a Japanese group where they have prepared diamonds from a graphite uh, nickel uh, mixture. Here you have the graphite peaks and very at, at 6 GPA you have graphite and nickel peaks here. If you go to 1,250 1, degrees, you can see that peaks from the catalyzer from nickel are growing just uh, because of temperature. And if you increase temperature just a little bit, nickel melts at, and at this very moment you observe the formation of diamond. So we have a lot of information from this experiment. First, you don't have any reaction at 6 GPA at these temperatures. The reaction only happens I mean, you don't have any reaction between the sample and the container or whatever. But at this, you have your sample formation at this precise temperature. And also we can try to, to get an explanation and an interpretation of what is happening here. And what is supposed to happen is that when nickel, when nickel melts, you have a, a, a solution of of diamond and graphite in the melt and the solubility of diamond is slightly less than that of graphite so the solution becomes oversaturated in, in, in diamond and that's when the diamond begins to grow. That's the explanation they, they are providing in this, this paper. Once you know the, the, the pressure temperature conditions then you can go to, to very big presses to prepare diamonds in big quantities. I, I have finished here and I would like just to uh, 
recommend you some bibliography, uh, a book that is going to appear in October. And there is a chapter about structure determination where, where you can find most of the information I have given to you. And also, as I, I promise, there is a section about X-ray absorption that I would like you to, to read because it's a very powerful technique. So thank you very much for your attention. I forgot just to mention this point. Thank you. A uh, question regarding the uh, zinc selenium telluride. Uh, uh, does your result mean that uh, this cinnabar uh, intermediate structure uh, has not its own stability field and is uh, has not? Sorry. Uh, uh, does, does this phase uh, have uh, its stability field in pressure, or it's just? Uh, and how to know this? From from a theoretical point of view, the, the the energies were very very similar. And how how to distinguish between this? If it is really stable, has a stability field, or you are just observing it because kinetical aspects. I, I don't really know if, from an experimental point of view, we can make a distinction. I don't know. In your studies on uh, gallium sulfide, uh, have you used a single uh, X ray diffraction, single crystal X ray diffraction? Did you observe the phase transformation uh, in the cubic uh, high pressure phase with gallium sulfide? Uh, not with gallium sulfide, no. We, we didn't arrive to such high pressures in this experiment. We have some work on indium uh, selenide. Which the problem that the people, uh, as far as I understood from the experimental data, the people couldn't uh, refine the structure of this high pressure phase. Uh, no, that's that, the position about the structure. Yes, that's why I was saying that X ray absorption is very interesting. You, this structure has only, if I remember correctly, one degree of freedom. So you can use X-ray absorption to determine the bone length. I have, I have learned this. Because it, it's not easy to work with single crystals, with high quality single crystals. So it hasn't, well, well gallium sulfide has been refined, but at the, up to 10 GPA, if I remember correctly. There is work by Holzapfel, I think. Okay, let's thank the speaker again and we are going to the next one.